Our scripture reading for this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant to us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. When the 10 heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of us, word of God for us, the people of God. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, I pray the words of my mouth and the thoughts on all of our hearts might be acceptable to you. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. One of the uh, things that I sometimes do, not always, but sometimes do when I prepare for a sermon, is to go through a process called manuscript diagramming. This is a fairly long, drawn-out process, which is why I don't do it all the time, but part of this process is coming up with uh, different headings for the part of scripture that you are working with. And the heading that I came up with for our scripture for today is, the best seats are in the back, which seemed like a fairly good fit. Like it's sort of what James and John are talking about and what Jesus talked about when he asked them to sit on his left and on his right hand in heaven. But the more I thought about that, uh, the more I thought that some of the back seat Lutherans and Methodists might not appreciate it. So I came up with a new one, which is, Healthy ambition. Healthy ambition. Because when you get to the heart of what Jesus is talking about with James and John, I think that is it. It was about healthy ambition. It was about wanting something. In this particular case, it, were, it was the seats of highest honor. So let's start off by wrestling with what it means to be ambitious. What is healthy ambition, and when can ambition get us into trouble? But maybe before we even get to that, the first question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we ambitious? So I'll ask that. Are you an ambitious individual? I hope that you say yes. I really do. If you don't, try and get some help. Because in and of itself, ambition is not a bad thing. It comes naturally. It is how God created us to be. Healthy ambition is a sign of positive self-esteem. And it's what we try to instill in our children from a young age, saying, you can do it. Just keep trying, keep practicing, and eventually you'll get the hang of it. And ambition is what motivates us. It's what gets us up out of bed in the morning, wanting to do our best. And at the heart of ambition is a healthy appetite, this hunger for recognition, this hunger for reward. And according to Scripture, again, that is how we were created. In the book of Genesis, we're told that God took a piece of the earth and he fashioned it into a human being and blew into its nostrils the breath of life, and it became a living being. It's in chapter 2. And what we need to know here is the word that's translated into living being in the Hebrew is the word nepesh. And nepesh literally translates to mean a bundle of appetites. Interesting, isn't it? That we are a bundle of appetites. And it's this bundle of appetites that stirs a hunger within us to want things, to savor the goodness of life, to flex our muscles and prove our ability to accomplish big goals. A healthy appetite is essential also to good health, and it lies at the heart of healthy ambition. We hunger for something that we do not have, and that hunger is what drives us to excel, to 
want a college education, to want a more prominent position at work, a better salary, a, a loving family, a comfortable home, a good name in the community. Now, students try really hard to make good grades so that they are recognized for them, maybe even getting a scholarship, which is important because once that kind of thing is instilled in children, that pursuit of excellence will stay with them throughout their lives. Young adults put in long hours, they go the extra mile at work because they want to move up the ladder. Middle-aged adults save and invest money in order to enjoy a comfortable retirement. It all has to do with ambition, that force within us that's, that compels us to strive and reach our God-given potential. When I was in seminary, I had the uh, opportunity to meet people from around the world. Uh, St. Paul School of Theology had students from South America, from Korea, from Africa, and other parts of the world. And I remember one student whose name was Orlando. He was one of three people in, in my graduating class, uh, I guess you could say, who received the Presidential Scholarship, which is the full-ride scholarship that St. Paul offers. He's a gifted individual, and he has a wonderful future ahead for him. And what made me remember Orlando was his story. Uh, he grew up in Mexico. He didn't grow up here in the United States. He grew up in Mexico, and like most families in Mexico, his family was extremely poor. It was partly due to the fact that his father was an abusive alcoholic. So one night, he, his mother, and his sisters fled in the middle of the night with only the clothes on their back. They were able to find a, a house to live in. It was a one-story house with a dirt floor, no running water, no electricity. But it was while they were living there that he met some missionaries in the neighborhood, and he became fairly good friends with them. And the missionaries worked hard to get him into a, a better house and to, work him, to get him into school. And while he was in school, he studied hard and he worked hard. He eventually worked hard to legally enter the United States to continue his education. And when he first came into the, to the States, he spoke very, very little English. But he had two things going for him. He had a deep faith in God and he had a good deal of ambition. He believed that God had a plan for his life and that he was going to fulfill it. He graduated from St. Paul at the top of his class. And that is called greed. Greed. Instead of wanting to do something that helps others and gives glory to God, you want to get all that you can for yourself. And the more that you get, the better. And if left unchecked, this can become like a cancer. It will just grow and it will spread and, and infect everything. And it feeds on itself. The more you have, the more that you want, which can lead to like an addiction-like tendency where no matter how much you have, it is never enough. And it doesn't matter what you're hungry for. It could be you're hungry for power or for prominence, for worldly possessions. Once greed takes hold, it can corrupt, and if left unchecked, eventually it will kill. Now, there are different examples that I could go with uh, about this, but the one that I'm going to give you is that of Kenneth Lay. He was the founder and the CEO of Enron. So Kenneth Lay grew up in Missouri. His father was a Baptist pastor as well as a tractor salesman, but he did not come from a wealthy family. His family was extremely poor. But he was an, a very ambitious individual. He eventually got accepted into the University of Missouri where he earned his undergraduate degree. And he went on from there to land a job with Exxon in Houston. That eventually led to his job as a federal regulator. And after that, the undersecretary to the Department of the Interior. He was a rising star without question. Now, when energy was deregulated, Lay returned to the private sector and he formed Enron. And it became a high-tech corporation. It was cutting edge. The stocks soared. Investors didn't seem like they could get enough. But as we all know, it fizzled. And then it crashed. As it turned out, Lay and his executives were cooking the books, as they say. They falsified reports to exaggerate their earnings. And near the end, Lay sold off most of his stock while he encouraged others to buy more. And when Enron finally went down, he walked away with millions. Others 
lost basically everything. Now, Lay had friends before he, he became quite wealthy, and his friends said that he really was a good guy at heart. But I don't think that you can deny that something went very, very wrong. Instead of enjoying the fruits of success, ambition got the best of him. In the end, he was convicted of fraud and conspiracy, and he would have gone to prison, but he died of a heart attack before his sentencing took place. The dark side of ambition is called greed. And we see it every time someone steps in front of someone else to get ahead. The, the, uh, <coughs> excuse me. That's the issue that James and John were bringing to Jesus today, was this dark side of ambition, this greed. They said to him, Teacher, we want you to do whatever we ask of you. Forget about all the other disciples. Forget about Matthew, Peter, Thomas, Andrew, Simon, Nathaniel. Simon, take care of us and give us what we want. That is the dark side of ambition, where you want different treatment and you're willing to step over others if that's what it takes to get it. And Jesus wasn't going to have any of that. He said to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And he continued on by saying, you are, shall indeed drink from the cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand and my left, that's not mine to give, but for whom it has been prepared. Brothers and sisters, we all have ambitions, and that's okay. It's how we were created. We all want various things out of life, which is natural. The issue is how we relate to others in the process. Are we determined to gain at cost to someone else? Or are we willing to step back and help others get what they want as well as we seek out our own ambitions? There's a story of a trap meet for uh, special needs kids, kids that had physical and mental uh, disabilities. A big part of this trap meet was the final race, the 400 meter run, which is a one-time lap around the track. The contestants lined up, the guns sounded, and they were all off. And everything went great until they got to the final 100 meters, which is the back part of the track where you pass in front of everybody. Once they got to that final 100 meters, one of the contestants stumbled and fell. And as soon as the others realized what had happened, they all stopped, turned around, and helped that runner get back on his feet. And then arm in arm, they walked across the finish line together. And as they walked along, everyone... Everyone cheered them on because they didn't really care who finished first. That wasn't really a concern to them. What mattered to them was that everyone finished, that no one was left out. And that is one of the marks of being a Christian. When we turn aside from satisfying our own wants and our own needs to attending to the needs of others, that doesn't make you any less ambitious, brothers and sisters. If anything, it makes you more ambitious. Instead, your ambitions are focused on something that is far greater than yourself. It's focused on the kingdom of God, and your joy comes in doing for others. I've, I've shared this story before, so I'm not going to share all the details, but I just want to remind you of the story of Osceola McCarthy, a little old lady from Mississippi who made her living doing laundry. She had a practice throughout her life of saving everything that she could, when she was 87 years old, she donated her entire life savings, which was $150,000, to the University of Southern Mississippi. And when she was asked why she would give so much, she said, I've always wanted to help somebody else go to college. That, brothers and sisters, is a healthy ambition. And in one way or another, we are all ambitious. I've said it before, I'll say it again, it is how God created us. Ambition is healthy when, we, when it motivates us to reach our God-given potential. It's the most healthy when we are ambitious for God. So brothers and sisters, I invite you to be ambitious. Be all that God created you to be. And may your ambition lead you to find fulfillment. Not simply by gaining more stuff for yourself, but by losing yourself in service to others. May it be so, brothers and sisters. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.